Hey, Sean, come check this video out. Airdrop it to me. Dude, just come check it out. Just email it to me or something. Maybe it's just me, but sometimes I look at a pile of wood before a project and think about how that rough pile of lumber is soon going to be a beautiful piece of furniture. And sometimes it's hard to believe, and this project was definitely one of those. I was commissioned by a winery to build a large table that would live in their new tasting room, and the client wanted me to build as much of it as I could out of lumber that came from a tree that had grown and then been milled on their property. And I'll be honest, it was a daunting and exciting project to take on. Now lately, as many of you know, Chris and I have been focusing a lot on building pieces of furniture that we can turn into furniture plans. We've really been focusing on designing things that translate well into plans that have a wide appeal and that we think people will enjoy building and will learn a lot from. So because of that, building a piece like this feels especially enjoyable as it's so different and the scale is so large, it's a welcome shift of pace. But don't worry, we have new furniture plans coming soon, so check out the link in the description. Now, the pile of lumber I was given might look like a lot, but I had to build a 16 foot long by five foot wide table. And on top of that, this wood had been sitting outside for years. So I had to deal with plenty of rot and bug damage, as well as plenty of cupping and twisting in a lot of the wood. Because of this, I spent the first couple days cutting down all of the slabs into usable boards until everything was at an appropriate size to mill. So now that everything was milled, and for the most part I only had usable material at this point, I was able to start resawing some of the boards to start making the veneer. A fresh blade is always a good idea when doing this, so while I switch that out, let's take a look at the design for a second. The table was designed to best utilize the material I received. Because none of the slabs I had were longer than maybe 6 feet, I created this alternating diagonal design so that I could stretch the lumber over the entire 16 foot length. And because of material constraints, as well as taking into consideration the varying grain directions, making a veneered top seemed like the best way to go. It might not seem like it in the video, but this was a wildly time-consuming process. You can really tell how bored I was by how much I'm looking at my phone during this clip. But after I had sliced up and sanded enough veneer, I could get started on the rest of the tabletop, so I first started to shape some Baltic birch plywood, which would be my substrate. Because the table was so large and had massive curves, I needed some huge templates. So I had a local sign shop cut them out on their big CNC machine. We needed four templates total, one for each side of the inner portion, and one for each side of the border section. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any footage of their machine running. So let's just pretend that the work is going very well. Because the table is so large, we also decided to build it in two halves, both for ease of transporting it, as well as giving the client the option to use it as two smaller tables if needed. So I essentially made two mirror image halves of the table. At this point, I was ready to start putting together all these strips of veneer, and I could use the plywood I just shaped as a roadmap. The 
This little sled worked great to give me zero tear out and make it super easy and safe to trim the veneer accurately. I then could start gluing strips together until I had the rough triangle shapes and I did this with wood glue and blue tape which worked perfectly. Once I had the triangles in rough form, I could use a track saw to cut clean edges on each seam side so that they could all be stitched together to form one large sheet of veneer for each half of the table. This was a fairly tedious process, but the nice part here was that nothing needed to be super exact as the veneer would overhang the plywood then get trimmed later, so there was a bit of room for error. At this point, I was getting very close to being able to apply the veneer to the plywood, but before I could do that, I gave it a little trim to make sure everything fit into the vacuum bag. And from there, I could mix up some epoxy and apply it to the plywood. We then flipped the plywood over and laid it onto the veneer so that the table was face down on the platen inside the vacuum bag. So we essentially had a 3 quarter inch melamine sheet, a piece of quarter inch MDF covered in packing tape so the veneer wouldn't stick to it, then the veneer, then the Baltic birch plywood. ran the pump off and on over the course of the rest of the day, then took everything out the next morning and it worked like a charm. The last thing I needed to do for the veneered portion of the tabletop was to trim off the excess veneer then I was ready to start working on the border sections. The border portion of the table was also going to be made with wood harvested from the client's property, but after cutting into what he had, I realized there was nowhere near enough for the entire border. The design called for the border to be six inches wide and at least an inch and a half thick to give the table a more substantial look. Because of this, I ended up getting new lumber, and I decided to go with cherry. So once the lumber was broken down and milled to final thickness, I could cut some angles onto the ends of each piece in order to make a large kind of segmented piece that the curve would eventually be cut into. I needed the border parts to perfectly match the radius of the curve of the inner veneered portion, so like I mentioned earlier, I used the large templates that we had a local sign shop cut, and honestly, having these templates is what made building this piece possible. Sorry to interrupt, this month we couldn't come up with a good segue, so I'm just going to toss Chris this jar of peanut butter. This bottle of water. This tiny bottle of cutting board oil. This $20 bill? 
This 1977 to 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit Jetta service manual. This ball of tape. And we can talk about this month's featured viewer project, which comes from Emily Hunt. Emily made this really awesome sprinkle chair, which is made from resin, ash hardwood, and you guessed it, sprinkles. She made this chair in a furniture design class while in architecture school and utilized a CNC router to create the mold, as well as two different types of sprinkles. She also has great taste in shoes. If you want to see more pictures and read more about this piece, go check out our website, which we'll link to in the description. We're going to be featuring a new project each month, and we're happy to be using Squarespace to help us build the website. Both Chris and I have been using Squarespace to build and maintain our websites for years now, and honestly, it's one of the best choices we made when starting our businesses. At the time, I had no idea what I needed to do to build a website, but Squarespace makes it super easy to get up and running with plenty of professional looking templates to choose from, as well as making things like purchasing domains really simple. Squarespace also has plenty of e-commerce tools to help you grow your business, things like inventory management, a simple and secure checkout process, and unlimited products allow us to easily manage online transactions and not get bogged down with the mundane tasks so that we can devote more time to doing the things we enjoy, like making a gigantic conference table or a sprinkle chair. So if you're thinking about starting a website, or even if you already have one, go check out Squarespace to see if it might be a better option for you. Head over to squarespace.com slash four eyes for a free trial. Then when you're ready to launch, use the offer code four eyes to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, thanks Squarespace. And if you wanna have one of your projects featured as well, Check out the link in the description for more details. So I used the templates to shape each border part, then I could use my track saw to cut the angle on the ends that would join together with the end piece. Cutting these joint faces with a track saw isn't necessarily my first choice, but because the parts were so large and curved, this seemed like the easiest course of action. And with such thick material, I always take a few passes to complete the cut, then come back and take a very light, full depth finishing cut because like they say, don't be a putz, take multiple cuts. The angles on the ends of the curved portions weren't super critical, as the end piece would be fine tuned to fit properly once everything was in place, which I did after dry fitting the curved portions onto the veneered center portion. It took a bit of fine tuning and sneaking up on a good fit, but with a little bit of back and forth, I got everything to fit really well. And at that point, we could glue up each half of the table. The glue up for these was a little tricky since we needed all of the dominoes to seat properly. And with the curves and the mitered corners, it was good there were two of us to get it to come together nicely. So once the glue had dried, I could come back and work on some of the tabletop details. I needed to round and trim the corners. to trim and edge band the opposite end, which would be the center of the table. And I needed to route out and fill the seam between the border and the center section of the table. 
This was purely aesthetic as I felt the top needed a little contrast which would tie in with the base and this also was an easy way to hide any small gaps that might have been left after the glue up. So with that the top was pretty much finished and I could get started on the base which once again required a bunch of milling to get all the parts to equal thick knife. I wanted the base to be pretty understated to allow the top to be the main focal point. So I kept it pretty simple. And by doing that, it just required a bunch of similarly sized blocks that would make up each base assembly. I also decided to put a large round over on the outside edge of the vertical sections to soften the look and tie the base in with the curves of the top. From there, I could glue them all up, which happened in two stages. I first glued up a bunch of squares, and when those were dry, I could cut two of them in half in order to make the T-shaped assemblies. And like I show here, always remember to cut first, then measure. Last thing to do before sanding and finishing was to cut in the hardware so that the leg assemblies could be attached to each other to make the table one piece. I used threaded inserts and bolts for this, which I first cut in before spraying the base black. then could do a similar technique to attach the bases to the underside of the table. I don't think the bases will be removed very often or ever, but if the table ever needs to be moved, being able to separate the top from the base will definitely make it easier. You missed it.